Hello again from the Community-Based Adaptation Conference in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And I have with me two people from CARE. And this is, uh, sorry, <laughs> Plan International, I beg your pardon. Perhaps we can edit that bit. Um, who are going to talk about children. And now it's all slightly rushed and I haven't even got your name written down. So please tell me your name and title. My name is Asalama Sidi. I'm the program support manager, so the program director for Plan in Niger. But I'm here on behalf of Plan International. Okay, thank you. Plan. Now, I know Nick Hall, but just tell us the title. Hello, I'm Nick Hall. I work for Plan International as the Disaster Risk Reduction Manager. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and we focus, of course, on children and being involved in their future. Okay, now Children's Climate Change Conference, uh, and I, we, I always have this problem. People, you go to a conference and when you go home, they ask you who was there and you name all these different groups and they say, what's that got to do with climate change? You know, isn't this an issue about desertification or tidal waves or whatever? So why, why is it so important that children have a voice here or that you and you, I assume, are, are seen to be representing them? Well, I mean, it's children's future that's most concerned about. One of the things we've found when we've been talking to children in lots of countries, in El Salvador and the Philippines and Niger, is that they are very concerned about the environment. They're also concerned about equity and that's one of the issues to do with climate change as well. You know, the balance of power and resource allocations around the world. They don't talk in that language of course, but they talk very clearly and straight about it. So children really are concerned about their own futures um, and we're helping them to understand about it and to actually take action about it as well very much locally because obviously children are most concerned about their local environment but sometimes they even get involved in conferences like this um, none here today but they were in Copenhagen and Cancun and Bali and other climate events um, so they really are concerned uh, we've seen the climate champions that um, British Council have organized to come here and make films so they speak it straight from the heart and they're really really articulate and they're very concerned about their future and right up from three four five year olds obviously you can't bring them to conferences but 15 year olds and 16 year olds teenagers you know they're often better educated than their adult than adults and I think the important thing is that they're they're privileged really that they are they're so young of course that's a privilege when you look at people like you and me um, they've got a long future in front of them and they're also privileged because they haven't got the daily duty of putting bread on the table and so on. So they can sort of see things in a slightly clearer perspective. And nor do they work for the World Bank or UNDP or Plan International. So they haven't got an institutional mandate either. And that brings a very fresh voice into these sort of events, I think. Um, and that's the job we've been doing is trying to carry that voice into the here and, um, and make sure that they're heard, not just invoked. Right. And in Niger? Is it an issue, is climate change itself an issue, and, and particularly for children? Okay, let me just add a few uh, words about why it's important to include children in this whole noble battle. <laughs> um, as Nick has said, and I would like to add that children are the majority of the population of the world. That's one. Second, children are very, very open, more open than adults, not biased as we are as adults, and children are the future of this planet. And climate change adaptation has to do with behavior change. Behavior change is difficult. It's more difficult with adults. So if you want children to be climate change adaptation sensitive and act so that climate change adaptation becomes a reality we need really to focus on them they are very enthusiastic they learn very easily and they act and in plan our experience has shown and we have a lot of evidences of how children when they learn can act very convincingly and very practically so that's why it's really important to, to, to you know to include children in this whole noble battle of climate change they are the future of the planet so we need to focus on that now to come back to your question about Niger yes climate change unfortunately affects the poorest countries of the world including Niger Niger has been experiencing for decades droughts 
And in any country where climate change hazards occur, the most affected people are those that are already vulnerable. And the most vulnerable are children. So droughts, in when droughts occur, children are not only physically affected because they don't have the right food on the right time to eat it, but also their rights are compromised, their rights to education. Because we, uh, we witness a lot of movement, a lot of population displacement, taking their children out of school. We also witness a lot of early marriages for girls. Girls are, even in normal conditions of time and weather and climate, this is one of our, the biggest issue in my country. Now, when climate change hazards occur, such as droughts or floods or, you know, any kind of disaster, to cope with the situation, families early marry their daughters. Families first marry their daughters. So this is, I would say, and there are a lot of other, you know, um, Im impacts, but I would just stop here to say that, in fact, climate change is not only a big problem for everybody, for the, it, the climate change is not only the greatest threat for human being, but climate change is a huge threat for human rights and children's rights achievement in general. Now, I'm not quite clear, so perhaps I, let me ask you this. It does plan in Niger. Are you, are you here because you can tell people about plan projects on climate change in Niger, or are you here to try and give children a voice in this process because so far they've been uh, less noisy, let's say, than many other groups? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm here for both. First, I'm here to, to share not only Niger ex Niger's experience in terms of involving children in disaster risk reduction, because so far we have been doing a lot of disaster risk reduction activities, but I'm also here to learn from the o audience, you know, from the theories, from the practices, from the conceptuals, you know, and also be a good advocate when I go back home you know, uh, about involving children, you know, in everything climate change related is about. Okay, let me ask you, Nick, you, you were, I was in one of your sessions, in a session where you rattled off some incredible statistics about uh, <laughs> uh, children, and how you, can you rattle off a few more or, or make that point about how, how directly affected they are? Well, I mean, disease affects are one of the key things. Cholera, diarrhea, dysentery, dehydration, dengue fever, malaria. These are very significant impacts of climate change, the consequences of consequences, and children are the most vulnerable to these things. So um, I haven't got the hard numbers in my head, I'm afraid. I wish I had. Um, but, you know, as, as, as Asalama said, more than 50% of the, of the population of the world are children and they are particularly vulnerable. Um, they reckon that 175 million children a year are going to be affected by climate change disasters, climate change related disasters. Um, and that's significantly more than a few years back. And the in impacts are really increasing. So children are bearing the brunt of it. There's no question about that, and, and um, the statistics prove it. And that's why it's important children are most vulnerable. But more important is that children are tremendously good advocates for their own future. And that's really what we're focusing on. It's not about victims we're talking about here. That, you know, that's, that's a, that message has got well across, I believe not about victims, it's about the fact that children themselves are really concerned and want to say and do something about it and we're trying to create the spaces for them to do it at, their, at home, right in the home as well, at the local level, you know, with their local governments in their schools and, you know, right up to the global negotiations and so, you know, that's why we brought children to Copenhagen and Cancun and they spoke pretty clearly about why we have to listen to them. Well, they spoke very clearly, and in fact, a couple of their um, comments, or their little uh, interventions in the process, were what many of us remember more than anything else. Uh, but do you think that, what do you think of the response you get? I was, I'm going to ask you what the response you get from government too in Niger, but at an international level, 
there is, of course, politicians always say, oh, yes, children are our future, we must take them into account. How much do you think it is really taken on board, or do they just regard it as, you know, we'll pat you on the head and say nice things? I think these things sort of filter into people's consciousness, just as you were saying, that's the thing you take home, your memory of it. So that's one side. I mean, I do think that when you do get smart, articulate children speaking clearly about these issues, policy makers do hear it. To the extent to which they actually change policy, I don't know. It's very hard to attribute your intervention compared to somebody else's, you know, what made the real difference. But I do get the feeling that children's rights are much more respected now than they were 10 or 15 years ago. And I think that's as much to do with the fact that children are actually asserting their rights themselves. Um, you know, I wouldn't like to claim directly that children who've learnt about their rights grow up and they assert their rights. And that's what we've seen in, in, in Libya. Not a climate change issue, of course, although perhaps to some extent it is because food prices drove, drove, um, drove some of that dissent. But all over the world, if you get young people really knowing about their rights and then starting to act on them, within a generation, less than a generation, you really do get change happening. So um, we see it as a rights issue, climate change, and we see it as an advocacy space for promoting children's rights. Is child rights an issue that's, as is it an idea that's accepted in Niger? Because some countries still insist on parental rights, even in the US, in negotiations often they say child rights have gone this far and that's enough, we've got parents' rights. What, what, how, what, how, do they, how is it handled in Niger? Children's rights is recognized by both the population and the government of Niger. The government of Niger has signed the United Nations Con Child Rights Convention since 90. Um, it's more than the U.S. has done. Since, <laughs> so um, that recognition is definitely there, and there has been a lot of promotion of children's structures, to children's institutions, to give the you know the 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 opportunity for children to to express themselves. However. Despite all these efforts and all this recognition of children's effort, it's still an issue. We have been pushing, the, so the civil societies have been pushing very hard recently to have a child code. It was about being adopted, but then for political and sometimes religious reasons, there are always challenging, challenges to have that code adopted. And despite all the investment that has been that has been done on the field, we still witness a lot of child abuse, mm. especially when it comes to girls' child again, because early marriage, as I have said, you know, and forced marriage are really one of the most um, witnesses, or I would say, uh, ma ma common, you know, abuses in terms of child, and especially child girl rights. So. Yes, children's rights is recognized, our government supports it, there are a lot of initiatives, but a lot needs to be done. And one of the best ways we think that would really take forward this intention, this motivation, and that would really create an environment where children would fully enjoy their rights is, as Nick has said, give the opportunity to the children so that they advocate for themselves. That's the best way to do it. We are civil society, can help with the government to have them really, you know, fulfill their rights. We can work with the children to know that they have rights and claim them. But the best way to ensure that children's rights would actually be a reality, no more a theory, is by giving the children themselves the, the knowledge, the capacity, and the opportunity to voice it themselves. Do you think there should be chil children at meetings such as this so that they can directly participate? I think there should be. I think there should be. We have been talking about how children do, how children can advocate, but they're the best ones to say it.
Perhaps we should leave it there and uh, with that thought for the organizers. <laughs> okay, thank you very, very much for coming in. I know it's been a busy time. Thanks a lot. No, no, no. I, was, I wasn't thinking myself. Oh, oh, lovely. Thank you. That's right, is it? I'm sure you've got it right. I have, I have actually, yes. I have actually a business card. Oh, he's just got a business card. Okay, thank you. That's great. I'm, I'm sorry, English is my sixth language. Six, okay. I know, that's the trouble with. English is my only language. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs>